Is there any particular question? Yeah, so do you see my screen? I just wanted to basically elaborate on the. Yeah. Yeah, so that's exactly what I just wanted to elaborate. Um, so there are two places where you can basically see your workspace. One is the portal, which you can see everything, including your workspace, like storage accounts, like if you've created a database or other stuff, SQL, whatever. You can create anything, you can basically explore everything. It has the older UI for the workspace. Some of the things are not fully developed because that's like older version. There is a new portal called ml.azure.com. Again, once you go home, you read this doc. I have spent a lot of time documenting the entire step and everything which is required, but just, just for you to follow. Um, there is another link, which is ml.azure.com, which is dedicated for only the workspace. So th the UI is more new, basically is recently developed and is still in preview, and preview means beta, not completely uh, released. But base what you can see, there are a couple of artifacts which are not visually accessible through the Azure portal. So you can only see through the, um, the, the ml.azure.com. That's again the new UI. So it's good to check both because it still is under development, but through the SDK, you can get everything. There's so many things which you can get. Again, UI is always a subset of everything you can do. Always UIs have limitations. And the reason we code is basically we can express very complicated things which is not available and, and visualizable through UI. So always get yourself more friendly with the SDKs and the code instead of the UI, U UI is a way just to uh, visualize things and get things connected. So again, data store is here, data set is here, but if you go to the portal, the data sets and data stores are not available, right? So there's a like version one of the UI, the, the ML.Azure is version two. <coughs> and um, the other thing I just wanted to share with you is that this workshop requires a lot of homework so within the class, you get the concept, but because of the actual hands-on, it's not a small code and snippet or a particular small or complicated algorithm, but like expressible in few lines. It requires a lot of like cells to execute and get yourself familiar. Get the concept in the class, spend some time a little bit like that in that 20 minutes, but definitely requires a lot of work at home to get yourself more confident and familiar with the concepts. And I try to express everything, and also the TAs have done a great job documenting many of the concepts on the other cloud providers. But it's definitely not the uh, docu official documentation. Still, you need to search extra and uh, study further if you want to get deeper into the concept. And this is a session, the, the, the in-person session, just to get grasp the general concept. Please spend time at home, and then ping us we will be responsive as soon as possible. We get and also deliver the TA hours for sure. So, um, so um, what we discussed till here is a way to basically encapsulate our project into a function and submit it to a remote node, right? So we managed to separate the code, the development environment from the execution environment we separated the data store from the compute environment and everything happens in basically execution time. If I go back to the, <coughs> again, these are like some of the um, commentary um, of what we discussed. So if I wanna like visualize how things happen, so first your development environment submits the job to the Azure, M Azure ML. It, based on the instruction you provide, if you're using the TensorFlow class, or you're explicitly providing your own Docker name or, or Docker image, it will find it within the Docker hub internally and then deploys it to the compute targets. And if you remember, we mounted the data store, right? So when we mount, the data store gets connected to the compute target at the runtime. And the efficiency here is that imagine you're working on an image problem which has petabytes of data or like I'm exaggerating, but terabytes of data, right? If you load everything to the target computer and process it, the download takes hours. But if you mount it, in every batch, it only fetches the part of the data that actually requires. 
not the entire data. It has, it will improve the data uh, ingestion significantly and makes it much more performance in real world um, deep learning problems. <coughs> it gets executed there and while it is executed, it creates a run object within the experiment and uh, everything which is happening there, the output folder, the metrics we're collecting, the snapshots and the, um, the logs which are happening at the OS level, at the Docker level and exec execution time are logged all of them under the run, under those four tabs, then later on can be, can be viewed. And that will be a stream back to your local computer if you're using that run detail class. But that's definitely a fancy thing to, to just visualize what's happening in the wild. And is, is very useful, but um, in automatic or, or, or non-interactive execution, if you like have a machine to just submit this job, definitely you don't want to visualize it every time. You want to keep the logs. If there's a failure, come back later. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to skip this, but spend time reading these. These are like a couple of data versioning tools, uh, which are like wildly recognized. Uh, but it still requires a lot of work, still not very mature. And also MLflow is a similar open source um, framework which you can use to track your model, um, track your experiments basically, similar to the way that it works. And also it works natively with the Azure ML SDK. So you can save it yourself and also save it within your MLflow. But again, it covers only the experiment tracking and not the rest of the ecosystem. <coughs> Some of the best practices for reproducible experiments, make sure you use Git. Use the abstract classes to, again, abstract the dockerization. Again, I didn't use anything from Docker. Everything happens automatically. Try to leverage that as much as possible. Um, leverage predefined dockers. Again, if, if the dockers are not there, we can basically, again, point it out to a Docker hub image. Many, like millions of dockers are pre-produced there. You can basically use them. Set the min node to zero for yourself. This experiment will be make it slower, but what it does, it scales down to zero and it will pay zero if you're not using the uh, compute targets. And again, you can leverage the auto scale feature. You can set zero to anything and it will scale up. Again, your free resource, you have limited number of cores, so don't burn it. And, uh, but in real experiment, in real life, you can basically leverage the auto scaling. <coughs> Now we go to the ML pipelines. <coughs> so in the ML pipelines, um, so a machine learning pipeline is basically a pipeline which is dedicated, built for machine learning tasks. There are some pipeline engine which are generic pipelines, like Airflow, for instance, or Data Factory, or I think Beam is also another pipeline, which you can basically uh, design a workflow like things happen after each other, like an ETL pipeline, for instance. It can be generically designed and, and developed, but they're not targeted for machine learning use cases. And for machine learning use cases, you probably want to have different type of compute target at every each run because of the um, like difference of the steps. Like one step you may need CPU, the other step you need GPU, the other step you need cluster of Spark, and et cetera. So you want to be able to orchestrate that. You want to be able to break it into smaller steps. And also at the same time, you want to track all of the experiments as the pipeline is running. The generic pipeline engines do not provide this. So you need to have a dedicated ML engine to basically be able to collect all of the metrics as the pipeline is executed. So what you need to have to do is basically, you can think of a pipeline as multiple steps. And each step does an atomic job, which you break it into a small task that it does certain thing. And then you will be able to stack them together as multiple steps to, to, multiple steps to basically build the entire pipeline. Uh, the um, beauty of that is basically gives you the, um, like the previous example, I had to be present on my computer to submit that TensorFlow job. But in real life, you want to have a machine to basically does that, right? And managing that should be happen automatically, not interactively. I shouldn't really sitting there. So they give you a lot of flexibility to basically build a pipeline and run it every time you want. And also the other uh, capability which provides to you is basically can provide it um, to an external service provider. Like for instance, if you're working with a data engineer and within their pipelines, they want to hit 
a machine learning, you want to basically train a machine learning model, you build your machine learning pipeline and basically provide an endpoint to the data engineer to basically use it within their own generic data pipeline, right? So it gives you a lot of flexibility. Or if you want to basically produce the ML pipeline and hit it from a local computer or another cloud provider, basically it can make it completely um, independent for you. And again, the only takeaway is you will separate it into multiple steps and each step is completely independent from the other step. And um, it will can happen automatically or sequentially uh, one after the other. That's the, the, the way it works. In the taxonomy, it basically located here, the pipelines, is separate from the experiments, but every time you run the pipeline, you can assign it to a new experiment. And once the pipeline is executed, every step is a run for itself. So you have like a data pre-processing step, like normalization step, training step, model validation step, running some machine learning tests and et cetera. Every of them are different runs under one experiment. <coughs> so now, in our MNIST example, beautiful, complicated MNIST example, uh, we want to like build a pipeline to basically go through that. Again, it's because it's super simplified and, and very simplistic example, we had only, we can have only like three m steps, we cannot literally go beyond that. So. The first step is the data preparation. What it does, it downloads the data and it uploads it, provides it into a shared blob storage. Then the next step is that gets the pre-processed one, which is like normalized and everything, trains the model. And the last step, registers the model, like registers the model into the model registry and validates whether this model is working well or not. And like, it, does it like beat the previous uh, performance of the previous model or not? If it beats it, so I want to store it. If not, I want to ignore it. Because in the third day, you will learn how to basically trigger the release pipeline by introducing a new model. So you don't want to introduce a new model if it is not uh, beating the performance, basically. <coughs> so going back, you have a shared default data storage, which is connected to the data stores in within the ML workspace. Uh, the first step downloads it. It's at the same time automatically sh saves all of the like um, metrics to the experiments uh, as a run. Then the data will be mounted to the next step. It trains the model and the model is saved under the output folder of the run. And the third stage, it fetches the model from the experiments, validates it if it is successfully beating the previous performance, it will register it into the model store. And the for first step, I want to use a GPU, CPU, because it's like a downloading and normalization. The normalization doesn't need anything. For the training part, I want to use a GPU. It's a TensorFlow job. I want to boost the performance. It's a very complicated problem. I want to use that. And the last step, again, I want to use a CPU, because that's just a picking the model and registering. Again, it doesn't need any complicated um, or any beefy uh, hardware machine, basically. Very simple job.